everyone, first of all, to yet another week, <laughs> or at least that's what it feels like, um, of Open Branding Month with Rebels and Rulers. So um, as you guys may know, we're doing these live Q&A sessions with some of our awesome speakers um, every day of the week to follow, you know, to follow the master classes that we have available for them um, in some of the days past. So um, today we actually have Richard here, who is Group Vice President for Brand Strategy and Identity at HUGE, which is huge <laughs> in and of itself. Um, he's, he's, he's here with us today. So welcome, Richard. Thank you again for doing this, really. I appreciate it. Um, now, the, the housekeeping, let's say, is that, uh, as you guys know, I always have my questions for, <laughs> for the person that I'm talking to, but please, 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 if you have questions, definitely write them in the Q&A function on Zoom or in the chat on Facebook, and I will do my best to introduce it into the conversation and make sure that everybody's voice gets heard. So just don't shy away. Um, don't shy away from doing that. But to that point, I think we can get started. So I like to, for 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 some of the speakers that we've that we've spoken to, I like to start with this question that kind of sets the tone for, I would say, how you think about the industry a little bit and maybe a little bit mm -hmm. of a broader foundation, just so that everybody knows where you're coming from with some of the other some of the other answers that you might give. So um, I would like to ask you, when it comes to the word brand. Um, what what do you think of when you hear the word brand nowadays? How would you define it? And and has it has it changed at all in in recent in recent years? Um, I think that's that's something that I always find interesting to hear from each of you. Mm, yeah, great question. Um, and hi everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you all today. Um, actually, before I answer that, I just want to say we're going to talk a lot about today. I think about um, you know my talk and the subject of you know, brands, you know, and, and how actions speak louder than words and the role of brands as corporate citizens. And I, I just want to say to you, Flavia, and, you know, in front of everyone that, you know, I think in terms of like setting an example for, uh, you know, living your values and um, making good decisions in difficult times. Uh, I think just the fact that we're having this conversation, you've set this up and your team set this up in this way, I think is a, is a credit to you. So, um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. You're so Okay, uh, I said I wouldn't cry in lives, so I have to just, <laughs> but thank you, thank you, that means so um, much to me. Of course, but uh, so coming to your question, what does it, what does a brand mean nowadays, um, and how's that changed? Well, I, I think for me, I, I, I've kind of had the same definition for a, a while now, and I, I think I still think of it as the same, and I really think of a brand um, as an expectation around a, an experience. Um, okay. So it's the experience you kind of come to expect um, from a brand based on everything you've learned up until that point. And I, one of my oldest mentors used to make this an uh, analogy of saying it, it, it's the movie that's played in your mind when you hear a brand name. So like mm. you, you, if you hear a name or you, someone says, oh, do you want to go here or here? Something comes, gets conjured into your mind. Um, and that's similar to kind of how we think about brands. You know, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're inspiring, sometimes they're dull. Um, but it, it, there's something always there. And that expectation is always built cumulatively over time, um, the product of, um, what the once uh, Disney CEO, uh, Michael Eisner used to say, a thousand small gestures. Mm. So it's really, and, and I think that's what's really, really interesting about today is we have so many different moments in which brands can add to that movie and add to that expectation. Um, before you would have some, you know, maybe that's the service interaction moment or buying or experiencing that product, seeing that one advert on your television screen now there's just so many moments in which brands can positively or negatively impact how you're seen but ultimately it all ends up in influencing your expectation around what an interaction will be with that brand in the future mm. that's so nice that you say that because one of the things that came up during the conversation that we were having at a different uh, a different situation here um was the idea of the small gesture, and 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 I actually I actually brought up the point. I was saying, you know, I think that this past year, what it's shown, I hope, to a lot of brands is that you can sit there and plan for as long as you want some kind of grand gesture, and it may feel great in the moment when people experience it. But I feel like things maybe maybe go as quickly as they come sometimes, you know. And if it's almost like too powerful 
then then it dissipates a bit and people forget and 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 it can be replaced and it can be uh, there's this there's this innate I don't know human quality that does this where actually the smaller gestures that are super surprising and really well placed and really well timed and all these things and that don't necessarily require so much preparation those are actually the things that you remember the most and I think that's mm -hmm. I think that's just as true for people in their day-to-day -day relationships as it is for people in their relationships with brands um, and so I'm glad to mm -hmm. hear that you yeah, they, you talk about the small gestures. Um, I think that's sweet. Uh, now, <clears throat> now, if we go a little bit more specific from from that, I think to like a very, a very tangible, let's say, component of brand, um, which is something that you're responsible for and that you work on. I know quite a bit, and that's brand identity. So, when it comes to let's say the foundational pillars of brand identity, have those changed over the years? Are there maybe new components of brand identity that folks, uh, you know, your clients or or even team members, whoever you're interacting with, still have difficulty grasping or or understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, especially when I, I think of how the design industry's changed um, in the last ten, certainly twenty years. Um, in the sense that you know and it kind of follows that similar theme right of going from limited you know touch points and interactions to just this this huge plethora and so many of them driven by digital uh it just means that brands show up and interact in very different ways and before you know what you needed as a brand identity and from a brand identity system standpoint those those elements were pretty straightforward um mm -hmm. you have a logo a name you know some typography some color um you know and that really was the basis of of, of a brand identity um or at least the system itself and you know I, I very much that was the focus but now um you know there's so much more focus on the system side of it um on the graphic elements on uh, the ui um and and what are the elements in that system that actually allow you to still recognize the brand without necessarily having to see the logo so that if i'm you know over the shoulder in a, a subway or train car looking at someone on their phone i can just see a you know, look a little bit of the interaction. And I'm like, oh, I know what brand that is. Mm. Or, you know, it's, it's the same as when you like fly by on a uh, on an interstate highway and you see billboard and you don't have to see the logo, but you know, if it's Airbnb or if it's Netflix, you can't, you know it because of how they uniquely combine, you know, graphic elements to create, um, to create equity um, so that, you know, you know what that brand is. Um, and, and I think that's really the, the biggest shift. And that's something that, you know, teams then have to, grapple with you know how you structure around that because therefore you need you just need a slightly different skill set to be able to both create those but also manage the the um how you own and uh, implement those assets because it very quickly gets into things like motion and motion principles you know how do you which don't really live in what would have been a traditional brand guidelines document of like a hard you know you know pdf um so you suddenly need you know digital guidelines that actually give you motion principles um, we're also working with a bunch of brands that most of their interactions now with their um, customers are through audio. Mm -hmm. So they'll be getting, you know, it, it, one's an exercise program where you're, um, you know, waking up in the morning and, you know, you're activating it potentially through an assistant and, you know, there'll actually only be um, maybe a few moments of actually seeing anything visual, if at all. So you need to replicate those, you know, what you would have previously of like a visual logo with a Sonic logo or ownable branded navigation that helps the, you know, user understand where they are in a certain flow, um, but in a way that's also proprietary to that brand. So you're building equity and you're systematizing audio in the same way as what you would have done with visual systems. Mm -hmm. um, you could say the same with, you know, scent in a physical environment. Um, so yeah, really the, the complexity is really, I think in line, really just involved in line with the, what we were saying earlier around the evolution of, of all the just different touch points that you can um, really interact with the brand in. But see, that's interesting because what what it what it sounds like is that we what it sounds like is that maybe we agree that there has been, let's say, kind of a radical shift from what used to be consistency and a focus on mega brand consistency across everything to some kind of, I think, in my opinion, less palpable uh, coherence instead. And so I'm, 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 I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that when you sit there and talk to clients, they have this question of, okay, well, if everybody's supposed to be authentic and we're supposed to give our employees some kind of freedom, 
to act mm -hmm. in accordance with the brand, but also be themselves and be human because they're our best chance of relating that kind of humanity to our customers. Then how do they grapple between, you know, too much guidance, too little guidance, you know, not forcing consistency, but rather creating an environment of coherence and, and making people feel like they can, I don't know, to, to a certain degree, own the brand as well and, and own what it means to be the brand. Is this a conversation that you guys have a lot with clients? Yeah, no, I think so. I think um, I think it really just comes down to what not really being really, really clear on what is fixed and what is fluid. Mm. Uh, and I think that's as true for your you know, brand strategy as it is about your identity. Like your purpose is something that, you know, you will as a rally, you'll rally around as a company and that will not change. And people understanding that in your organization that, you know, this is our purpose, this is what we achieve, allows them on a, a micro level to be more empowered to make um, decisions uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, most people in a company are, um, I've said this before, but are, uh, you know, uh, really trying to deliver on something on a quarterly basis or a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. but very few that actually sit thinking of like purpose, like five years out, um, like a CEO would. And really a good purpose should allow every employee to have that degree of big picture thinking um, versus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, knowing what the kind of things are to do in the micro, which again is the same thing I think for, you can apply the same thing to your visual identity and your brand identity, knowing like what are our sacred cows what are our want a better word what are our assets that we will not mess with because like you do still need to build equity you can't walk away from things too um uh, frivolously because it is a crowded you know landscape uh new entrants are coming all the time as people start to recognize things about your brand you do want to thoughtfully build those but to your point you do want to be flexible to evolve and you know change over time um, so I think the same things apply. It's knowing like what is our what is our core and what will not change, and then what are the elements that um, you know our you know employees or our teams have that flexibility to be more fluid and reactionary with um, as things go on. Hmm. I'm thinking about when it comes to building brand identity. I think as a as an external team rather than let's say in house, it already mm -hmm. posed a certain set of challenges, I think, from the from the get go. I'm, I'm assuming that you agree with this. I mean, there is a certain degree of, I don't know, uh, exploration and understanding that some people would argue you can necessarily get when you're not living the brand day to day, but rather working with multiple ones. But I think mm -hmm. a lot of agencies have proven that this is not true and that you can create extraordinary work regardless. But, um, but I'm wondering that now that we've added to that, let's say the physical distance imposed mm -hmm. currently, um, maybe things have become infinitely harder, or at least this is what I, this is what I imagine. So I'm wondering if, if your brand building process has evolved in any way with clients in order to adapt um, to that mm -hmm. and to make sure that you still, like you can still reach the same core level of understanding that you need in order to build a brand identity that is truly a representation of who that client is. Yeah, definitely. No, it's a great, it's a great point. And I think there's a, I mean, there's a couple of big macro shifts that I think are worth acknowledging. The first one just being the way in which I think agencies and uh, clients, for want of a better word, interact. Like mm -hmm. I think historically the relationship was a lot more um, kind of, ser you know, service or like order taking kind of um, environment. Whereas now I think it is a lot more like a partnership. Yeah, even on you know people who have even never worked in an agency, they have a pretty good understanding about how things are done. Um, they know what the tools are. They may have people on their own teams that have worked in agencies uh, with very similar skill sets. So it's actually more about how you work together and partner. Um, and yes, they have the continuity and the knowledge. You have you know the objectivity and the external market perception um, assessment. So it's how you kind of work together. And I think having that very honest relationship uh, and being very collaborative through the, through the process, um, it's probably one of the, I'd say that's just kind of an overarching macro trend that we've been seeing. Now, I think what's happened right now with everything being remote is we now have to do that in a remote environment. And I actually think, interestingly enough, we're seeing it in some ways work out better because everyone can participate because everyone you need to be in a, a Zoom call or um, we're big proponents of Miro, um, mm -hmm. M-I-R-O. It's a great uh, tool for um, virtual whiteboarding. Uh, you can all jump into the same platform, strategy, design, um, and be you know collaborating both in that session and outside of it. 
And you can therefore have, you know, very multidisciplinary teams in different locations on both the client and agency side, kind of sharing, aligning, making decisions, going away, working, coming back. And I actually think it's being actually way more effective now than um, what we, in many ways what we've done before. And then I'll just say one last thing, I think uh, that, again, this is another thing that, and all of this, I think, have just been maybe accelerated by the last year, but um, the move towards online guidelines. And I kind of alluded to it earlier. I said moving away from static PDFs. I think just making sure that, you know, you're setting yourself up with a system online that is uh, contains all of your brand assets and the rules for how to use them um, and guidance, maybe illustrative assets as well for real marketing um, touch points or product touch points that have been made. Um, and something that everyone can effectively access. And there's, you know, you can either build that custom or there's some great off the shelf programs. Um, Frontify is one that comes to mind that we've been using a little bit. Um, and, and they're pretty cost effective solutions that allow you for that kind of effective, fluid, ongoing brand management in a virtual environment. Hmm. Nice. Okay. I have to look, I didn't know about that one specifically, so I'll have to look it up. Um, now, if I if I if I may go back to your to your presentation for a moment, so your presentation was very much about walking the talk, right? And and the role that brands have, um, I think, in society. And you mentioned in your presentation that brands have begun to play a role, and I think I'm quoting you here that brands have begun to play a role similar to the role of age-old institutions like local churches, community groups, and even governments. Um, would you say that this year has proven or disproven that notion? Are you still of the same opinion? I love this question. And it's funny, I was, um, I hate watching my, um, myself speak, but in preparation for this, I did go back for a little bit because I just wanted to remind myself, given that it's been a year, exactly what I did say. And that thing did actually stick to mind. And it's actually honestly something I've thought about a lot this year. Um, and I honestly don't know if there's a, 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 if I have a really simple answer for you. Mm -hmm. That's because okay. Because I actually think, <laughs> I think in some ways, yes, it has, but also I think in some ways, no, I think I've actually been proven a little bit wrong because I think we've actually seen in 2020, I think limitations of brands. We've seen, frankly, the fact that the, what it takes to uh, really like coordinate population movement or instigate the mass production of masks and ventilators um, and then ensure the fair distribution of them. Like these are, these are big ticket uh, initiatives that really you know, need to be driven by governments. And I think we've almost, uh, maybe brands have played too big a role or we've got to a point where we think brands can do so much um, mm. and then realizing that, I, and, and maybe it's because of the failing of governments, but I yeah. think there's been a real, certainly we've seen this in the US, a need for you know, authorities to step up, institutions to step up. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, people ask brands to have more perspective on, you know, some of uh, healthcare um, protocols. And it's like, well, no, we need to listen to scientists and we have institutions where those scientists work and we need to listen to them. Um, I remember at the beginning of lockdown, we had all celebrities communicating about what you shouldn't or shouldn't do um, about the virus. So well, really, again, it's, we have the CDC have their guidelines, the WHO have their guidelines. We have, you know, established, um, you know, healthcare ministers, and that's 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 where we need to be um, kind of listening in those moments. So I, th I think that was an interesting um, moment. But at the same time, I, when I say in some ways, no, I do think we have seen at the same time, some brands step up and um, play roles in interesting ways um, in society. Uh, you know, I think in the US particularly, we've seen brands align themselves closer to politics and historically partisan issues way more than ever before um you know we've seen a lot of there were a lot of lists that were getting published around you know which uh brands and companies were associated with donating with political campaigns before mm -hmm. um which is it's just really interesting to me because it really creates this um interesting um position for for brands and business leaders to be in um which yeah i just find i, I just find fascinating I think a lot of a lot of them are also grappling with the idea of do I need to say something like do I need to have an opinion on the matter I think there's also um, and I don't know how I don't know if you you know do this kind of work with clients or if you have these kinds of conversations with them I'm assuming you do because it's very you know like a core component of the brand but they sit there and they wonder like 
do I have to say something? I'm being, even if they are asked to say something, the question is, do I engage or not? And, and I'm wondering what, you know, what goes into that decision? How do you advise as an advisor? Because it's really what ro the role that you play a lot of the time. How do you advise for that? I mean, mm -hmm. what goes into that decision? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing we would say is the fact that if, if, you, if you're wondering at the time, first you're wondering, should we say anything? And then like, do, what do we say? Uh, and if there's so many different options on the table, then then you've got a problem. Because I think it means then you're not clear enough about coming back to what we were saying earlier, what your purpose is as a company and what your kind of priorities are. Um, we've done, like I say, just for an example for ourselves, doing it huge for a minute. Uh, we spend a lot of time working out what's important to us. We talked to you about before I mentioned in the talk, you know, making things people love and our values as a company. Um, but we also have three big strategic areas that are important to us as a company, which are uh, de and i sustainability and data privacy. Mm -hmm. And those have been three things that we've been focused on for 12 to 18 months at this point. And we have a series of initiatives that support each of those. Um, and those are things that matter to us. So if there are things related specifically to any of those three things, we will have an opinion on them and we know mm -hmm. what our opinions are on them. So therefore, you know, we will speak out. Now, if it's something that it isn't related to those opinions and some things have come up, um, we haven't because it's not, it's not related to those things that we are, we are striving to have an opinion on and, and, and make a uh, positive change around uh, and have made commitments on. Um, so I feel like, I feel like it's like doing that kind of personal work. It's almost, it's very, gets very psych, you know, almost like um, very psychological at that point. It's yeah. like, you know, what, who are we about? What do we believe? And it's, it's tough because you've got to align. You're not talking about an individual there. You're talking about a, often a leadership team. Um, and yeah, and you need to, you know, really have some, some of those tough conversations. And I think this year has prompted a lot of that. Um, it just, it just, you know, it, you're not going to solve it in that like 30 to 48 hours um, where you're trying to respond, whether to put a tweet out or respond to a tweet, it's going to happen in, um, the, those long pauses between those moments where you have to do the work and figure out what is important and then, and then act towards those. Hmm. So then, so then, uh, this brings me to another thing that you mentioned in your, in your presentation, which was an Edelman study that cited that 56% mm. of people agree too many brands use societal issues as, as like a marketing ploy just to sell more products. So. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, do you think that the extremity of 2020 has helped to propagate that, let's say, bad behavior even further, or did it actually empower brands to be more honest? Mm. I think it just, it just kind of, to, to, the, to what we were just talking about, kind of showed or laid bare the companies that had, you know, spent the time and had genuine focus on societal issues that, um, where social justice actually does matter to them. And then the ones who were being more opportunistic and seeing it more as a, and using it as more of a marketing ploy. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's something that I know a lot of, which has come up a, a bunch on these, um, the other live causes, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's is a great example here in the US. They're an you know, ice cream company who've always supported, um, you know, social justice reform and, you know, them speaking out against white supremacy, that was authentic to them as a company, as a brand, um, versus, you know, something like L'Oreal, who's, you know, came under a lot of criticism um, when uh, Monroe Bergdorf called them out for their hypocrisy, um, when they were calling for, you know, ends of racism, when, you know, she'd said that, you know, they experienced just things just, just within two years of them saying that. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I actually just think it, it's really brought to light um, who's, who's done the work and who hasn't done the work. And I think for brands that, you know, hadn't figured out what their perspectives, not even just perspectives were, but what they wanted to focus on and how, and if and how they uh, wanted to translate that into actions, then now has been the time that they were hopefully putting that, um, that in place. Hmm. And do you, do you feel that, uh, do clients seem to understand this concept of walking your talk or, or is, you know, your take on purpose and the way you're talking about it now still a bit convoluted. Yeah, I think I think most clients get the notion of um, you know actions being more important than words. I don't think you know people, but I think the problem is that it, it's the unconscious stuff that people don't even recognize. Um, and often I think it just becomes un, un, when you've just got an organization that again hasn't invested in it and hasn't 
um, you know, spend the time talking about it at a leadership level. And otherwise in isolated pockets, you are, you know, you're doing marketing work in a silo and, you know, that team may feel very proud and passionate about the work that they're doing, but, you know, you've got to look at it within the context of the, the broader whole of the business. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's a lot of it comes down to, I think some of that almost like it's not change management, but it really kind of is like uh, making sure that these things aren't just specific to pockets of a business nor actually uh, the discussions that are happening at a, at a core at a core leadership level um i'd also just say that i think in terms of sophistication i think some clients still struggle to notice the difference between things like purpose and your positioning mm. like knowing that like your purpose is something that is it's not about it's not about other people it's about you as a company it's about what you assert about what matters in the world and how you're going to help drive outcomes versus your positioning which is definitely more related to it's obviously influenced by that but it will change over time and it will change as a result of different market dynamics based on who your competitive set is and what is driving user behavior at that moment. Um, but I, I don't think those that 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 is something that is always widely understood um, on the client side. And I think that's where we get into some up, kind of some of that education piece definitely comes up a little bit more. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask is because it feels like one is maybe a little bit more of a longer term play than the other. And so then when you're sitting there trying to fight for budget and for time, you know, and, and, and let's say something that is more related to positioning, even like you said, market dynamics, there are certain quantifiable elements that you can pose up front and say, this is why, you know, we need to focus on this right now. But I feel like with mm -hmm. purpose and what you're saying it, to a large degree, it's, it's still relatively uh, not so palpable. It's not so easy to bring the right convincing factors to the forefront. So what do you use? <laughs> How do you explain to them that this is something that's important to focus on, even though it might not be, you know, uh, absolutely clear what the immediate results are for the for the business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and that's always that's always tough. And I think that's where you also just have to have a very truthful conversation around, you know, what type of company are we in? And, and, and I can also acknowledge just the market environment in which we're in. And like, if you're a public company, you know, you, there are today, I mean, there's a lot of efforts to try and, you know, re make shifts around, and we talked about that, obviously, in my talk around, um, you know, what expectations are of public companies beyond delivering shareholder value. But um, I think people, you know, you need to acknowledge, you know, what do we, what do we need to deliver in the short term? And what can we do in the long term? Um, and be, be transparent about that. Um, you know, every company has a strategy um, and a vision. They just don't necessarily always communicate it out because maybe sometimes it's not that they're not that proud of it um, or mm. that it doesn't align with where they want to go, you know, from a from a from a purpose, from a marketing, from a mission standpoint. Um, but it's actually much better, I find, to actually communicate what the vision is and then work within the restraints of that, because if not, you're going to just you're creating a two headed dog whereby you're you know, and one thing saying, yeah, we support this, we want to do this. And all your employees then say, yeah, okay, we're going to rally behind these initiatives and you start doing stuff. And then suddenly they don't get funded or they just fizzle away. And then you just say, well, what's happening? And then those, those, that, those, those talented people, they will leave um, versus communicating, well, okay, this actually, you know what, this is our mission. This is what we're, this is how we're going to have a deliver strategy because um, this is how we're going to deliver based on the strategy that really is, is our reality. And this is how we're going to do the best within that context. Um, now, you, or again, you will you you might risk losing some talent there in, in a different way because they're not inspired by uh, that as a vision. But at least your ability to then deliver on that is going to be far greater because everyone's working towards the same goals as an outcome. Hmm. We have a question. We have a question from somebody. And before I move to the next topic, I uh, I'll bring it up now. But they're asking, what about vision and purpose getting mixed up? And then there's mission and then values. How do you untangle this sea of buzzwords or old world brand frameworks? I'm assuming into something that makes more sense. Mm. Or are some of these words have they merged to a certain degree? I mean, is there there also might be a need to just <laughs> remove some of them and choose to focus only on a few because i feel like one of the things that keeps coming up in these lives is that we as an industry are responsible for the fact that clients are confused because we keep giving different names to the same thing we keep finding you know like we want to be uh i don't know the company that own we want something ownable 
for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you would just end up naming it something completely different. So obviously they're confused. <laughs> um, and so maybe, you know, I'm just adding to, I'm adding to the question, but, uh, but I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you talk about it a bit. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think that's a great point. And I, I've worked at companies that definitely had those like ownable frameworks um, that you need to create and solve for. Um, we don't, I'll be honest, we don't really have that. We just, I think it is more of a reflection of being very user focused and, and in the context of our client relationships, our client is the user. So we kind of, I guess, try and lead towards the language that they use. Um, but at the same time, we will point out when things are uh, missing. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I think a lot of them, are the, certainly the tried and tested ones are important. Um, I think the problem is, is when you're trying to solve them and whether you need to solve them for the outcome that you're trying to create in that moment. I think often, you know, we'll be working on a project and let's say you're making a website or a campaign or maybe it is just a brand strategy project, but um, we'll come in and say, you need to do all these different things. And actually for this moment, uh, we don't need to do all those things um, to your point. It's actually, you know, we're going to focus, we're, we're only going to focus on the, you know, these two things, either because it's what we have time to focus on um, or because those are the two things that are most ill-defined for your company. Hmm. Um, but I do think you'll find that m you do kind of need all these elements. You need to have a vision as a company. You know, a vision as a company is, you know, how, you know what, are, what are we trying to achieve? What, you know, how are we going to make money? Um, you know, what markets are we going to be in? Um, what geographies are we going to be in? Um, that's pretty important. Um, you need a, a purpose, you know, that higher order ambition of what we're trying to achieve in the world. Um, and then you need values for, you know, to, to show how you, what you, you know, how you're actually going to interact and, and tell your employees like what behaviors you think are important. Um, so I think they do all connect, but I think, you know, they're not always um, explained in the most clearest way. I'll also say that, you know, how you then turn to communicate those out to your audiences um, at different times is completely dependent again on that ask. So if you, you know, let's say you're deciding to do a campaign to internally to employees, it may not be the thing to communicate all of those things at once. It may be that, you know, what we're really trying to ch change is behavioral change at that time. So maybe you're going to focus on maybe your purpose and values. Um, mm. I, so I think just being really clear about what these pieces are and what the role is of each, um, I think is, is yeah, important. So are there are there any things about, uh, let's say, about brand strategy in terms of like bigger trends that you're looking forward to seeing evolve, let's say, over the next year? Is there something that you're super excited about being that, you know, you work in brand strategy and identity? Is there is there a trend that you're seeing that you're, you know, <laughs> really excited about? Maybe it's less a trend that I'm hoping to see or that I am seeing and what I hope to see. And I think that is a, I think we'll see a reaction to all of the kind of millennial-esque like branding or like blanding. It's got a lot of coverage um, that is, has just allowed so many brands to come to market that just combine, you know, a Pinterest-esque, you know, trendy millennial aesthetic with, simple you know digital interfaces mm -hmm. um because i think the biggest danger of that is it's really replacing um or threatening genuinely great products services and companies that have great heritage that just haven't adapted well enough to those environments um, i mean i live in new york city and i just you know you walk and you see all these like small stores closed that have been around for you know hundreds of years and um you know, so, uh, that sell products than, uh, than themselves been around for a long time that have, you know, great knowledge and great products in them, but they just haven't adapted well to the marketing environment. Their, the look and feel of their brand doesn't necessarily reflect the, that kind of what has been, you know, on trend or, um, you know, they haven't been able to sell themselves in a, a digital uh, environment, whether that's through social channels or just through their website. And I think I fear that uh, that will be the, you know, we'll, we'll see a death of some of those things, um, some of those, you know, more, you know, historical companies um, and brands and products. Um, but but I, I kind of hope that we will we'll see a backlash and there'll be a, an acknowledgement to this and people will see, right, do we really need another, you know, ramen kit delivered to your door? Um, 
you know, like, is that worth investing in? Like, do we really need these these new upstarts uh, companies, or actually, do we have some great products and services um, that already exist today? Um, and 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 how can we like better? I don't know, bring those to the floor. And I think you are seeing it in some, and we may see it. I think in design, we'll see a more maximalist, you know, turn away from you know all the very simple, you know, aesthetics. I mean, you see it in. Um, even in like, I remember traveling before the, before the pandemic, I'd be going to these coffee shops around the world and I'd be like, I feel like I'm in Brooklyn. And then I realized that like people are just designing from the same sources of inspiration and then everything starts to look the same. And what people then crave is something different. So I think as like, it's been easy to just do a simple, clean design. Um, what will true talent will become in creatives that can create really maximalist, like bright colors, some really interesting creative expression that is authentic to um you know that company and that brand um but in a way that stands out and really engages people um or at least that's what i hope <laughs> i love that i feel like i feel like uh i feel like it sounds very similar to what we always uh, what we always talk about with you know campaigns that are done just for the sake of awards i think it's the same mm. it's a similar I almost said infidelity, which maybe maybe shows how serious I take the brand. <laughs> but um, but that same that you know a similar a similar notion. But it's but it's interesting that you mentioned because you know we were talking about these buzzwords and how everybody wants something ownable. And I feel like before the context of today, um, and not that it has changed, but you know the word of the day was always transformation, 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 mm. and. I would, I, I almost wish, ironically, that it was completely quantified how many companies, let's say, have transformed now as a result of what's going on, or if they're still struggling. Like how many actually with, because some people would say, oh, you need a good push. And then people will finally see the light of day. And I'm starting to think that I don't know anywhere that I've read or seen that truly quantifies whether that's true or not. And to your point, there are probably a lot of great businesses that, I mean, even here that have just disappeared and, and, and for what? Um, mm. So I think it's quite interesting, but I think it's also a matter of, a matter of how you treat change management. I think there mm. are obviously a few options. I don't know, um, because I think that when you work with brand strategy and identity, there's obviously some kind of change management that is always involved that you need to advise your clients on. And I'm wondering, is, is it ever just as simple as saying, you know, well, it's either top down or it's bottom up, or is it a combination or is it, mm. because I think this is one of the first questions that I've seen always come up in other discussions is that people don't seem to agree as to which direction it comes from actually. Mm. Does it come from the leaders saying this is who we are or does it come from them listening and realizing this is who we are as an organization and then, you know, kind of taking the next steps. That was a very long-winded question, but do you have any thoughts? No, no I think uh, I'll try and give a, a less a, 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 a less confused answer would be great. I think. No, it 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 it's it's a hard topic, so I'll um I'll try and break it down in how I think about it. But I mean, in short, to your question, top down or bottom up? Top down, like you're not going to achieve any degree of change or transformation. It is not bought in. Um, and believed in by a leadership team. I'm sorry, like all the all like great will of an employee base. Um, mm -hmm. Like you, you, you can't you know crowdsource uh, transformation. You can't crowdsource you know business tra business transformation. Like it's just not it's not going to happen. Um, I've just seen too too many great ideas and initiatives quashed because a business wasn't ready. When I say a business, that leadership team wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't really believe that they needed to change. Um, now, that's not to say that employees aren't, I don't want to like downplay the role of the employees and the team and the talent. Um, they are essential. And without them, you will never change either. Um, but in terms of where it starts, it, it has to, it has to be, it has to be um, top down. There has to be belief from the top. It has to be driven from the top down. Um, otherwise, you just, yeah, you're not going to get anywhere. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. I'm wondering then, I mean, because after that, you get to the point where, where 
you know, the sustainability of that change and everything that you've put into place relies heavily upon the rest of the organization though. So what mm -hmm. kind of, and I know that you talk a lot about culture and about internal culture mm -hmm. and especially working at HUGE, which, I mean, if you can bring any, any, any light from there, because I think that from the outside, at least it looks like the culture is very identifiable. Like we, we feel like we know who you guys are. And I think that's amazing. Um, but how do you, how do you, you know, what does the internal culture look like that you need in order to sustain, I don't know, even, even the, the level of change that needs to occur, you know, as often as it needs to nowadays, because it's not just about, you know, we convince you once and then it's going to be the way you, you know, you thought it would be for, I don't know how many years now it can come at so many points in time that you need to make a radical shift of some sort. Yeah. And it really comes, it, it comes down to communication and transparency and having a clear purpose. I mean, it, it really does. Um, because if you can have that, and that's actually in line with what you're actually trying to achieve as a company um, in terms of your business vision, um, then, then employees can align their, you know, own goals and behaviors uh, around those. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't have that then again there's that dissonance earlier that i mentioned when those if those things are too aligned then you know people it may not be apparent at the moment and it might it might look everything might look rosy but it's just you start to feel it you've seen i've seen in organizations where initiatives just just fall off they just disappear um, and that's because there wasn't that um clear through line from you know business vision your you know your brand purpose your you know values as a company um and and then you know the things that people could you know, rally behind and focus on. Um, Cause it really, if you, those things are clear, that helps not just you, you know, your, your talent focus where they put their energies, but it helps you, you know, attract the right talent in the first place. Um, it helps the talent that, you know, will succeed and thrive in that environment, you know, do better. Um, so I, yeah, I, I really can't, that's why I can't really stress enough how important that, that, that work is um, mm -hmm. to, to set, to almost like just set the train on the tracks because once that's done the thing will move and the thing will move with such velocity because the, the the energy that can then be created by your workforce is far greater than you'll ever do um you know at a leadership level but it, it's ultimately that group that needs to to set the vision and empower um empower your talent to to act in that to act in that way um you know i shared some of the the things that we believe in um and, and our beliefs and, and values um, and the presentation. I mean, it, it, those are things that people quote <laughs> each day. Like we'll be in meetings. So like, where are we doing this? How are we doing that? Are we, are we doing the right thing here? How do we plus the ask? How do we, um, you, know, they, they, you know, should we take an ax to it? Like it, it becomes part of the vernacular. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. And, 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 and I don't know if you want to answer this from the perspective of huge or from clients that you've worked with, but what do some of the really, um, I don't know, really good approaches to keeping your pulse on that look like? I'm talking about like feedback loops and everything that you need to stay, to almost, you know, rest assured that it is going in the right direction, that it's still there after you've made the decision as a leader. I mean, how do you keep your your finger on the pulse of that, let's say internal culture or how that that identity and that strategy that you put together is actually being propagated maybe even outside the organization to to customers themselves have you seen any mm. you know like really great work there where you say aha you know that's that's a great great idea or maybe something you've actually <laughs> done yourself for clients i don't know yeah no no i think that's really important i mean getting that live feedback um and i think there are some basic things you can do like employee surveys are great um and setting them more than just once a year um, but I think more than that, I think actually how you create um, like more formal structures around it, like whether it's having an employee um, kind of committee um, mm -hmm. that can meet regularly uh, and actually, you know, raise topics and conversations that are coming up um, in your kind of, in, you know, talent base that are things that are, that are important to them or questions that people have, um, because you'll be amazed that like, you know, people far more savvy than I think often people think. Yeah. Uh, and especially the more junior talent as well. I think they come in and aren't, you know, institutionalized or haven't been, you know, uh, 
maybe exposed and to the same experiences that have kind of quashed their not their quashed their hopes and dreams but um <laughs> i don't know they, 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 they just have that more i think uh open kind of question mind yeah. when it comes to these things so yeah. i think you want to be able to harness that but i think you need to create you need to create the healthy environment for those things for that energy to go because it will th those people will be thinking it anyway um you and you know you've seen things like fishbowl um come up which are um I don't know. Is, is fishbowl outside of the US? I've only known it here. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's any. I'm pretty sure it's not here, but I don't know if it's in any other countries yeah. that I don't know. So I remember it from the states, though. Yes. Yeah. So it's like an anonymous uh, platform you can sign up for, and you know, people who work at a company can leave you know messages. And uh, in some regard, I don't like things that are anonymous because I think they can become very quickly become uh, vehicles for hate and for um, which isn't great, but I will say that the engagement on those will do correlate to, you know, you as a company not creating that channel for uh, people to share feedback mm -hmm. um, and for things to get addressed. So if you're creating the environment, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you a real example, actually, um, company I worked with, they started off, um, they never, they were very criticized for not having any um, basically a uh, vehicle for employees to give feedback mm -hmm. and but, and as a result people when they did open it up it was kind of uh people were almost too scared because the culture wasn't there to actually get feedback so that if they did say well what's your feedback no one would actually share Me it because they were yeah. too scared to um so as a result what they they, they kind of had a, a new leadership team came in that we were working with and they basically introduced uh had a town hall and it was an, an anonymized um uh feedback questions mm -hmm. and it was amazing the level of engagement they suddenly saw overnight um because suddenly people were like oh, giving feedback and asking questions and engage and saying all the stuff that they've been too scared to say um now obviously that's not ideal but it was about baby steps and it was about encouraging just that dialogue to start um and over time you actually saw it was really interesting uh people would stop doing it anonymous people yeah. started taking ownership of the questions um to a point where it got and uh, you know someone said that i don't even know the last time an anonymous question was asked in one of those environments mm. can't even remember it. they're not even sure the feature still exists because after a while it just became part of the behavior but that was like you had to consciously work towards that um, and it was amazing because at the time you may have said, well, the culture's cool. Yeah, everything's good. On the outside, everything looks fine. Um, but that's actually because those conversations, they're just, they're just happening over there. You're just not, you're just not hearing them. That's so neat because it almost, it almost, it almost gives you the impression that even if somebody in your workforce doesn't necessarily have a leadership role, you almost have a missed opportunity for giving some people a different kind of leadership role, which is to be the voice for a larger you know subset of the internal population which mm -hmm. is a whole like a whole missed opportunity for for some of them that you know might be really good at doing just that to your point i'm i'm thinking that to a large extent that might be also why some of those people stood up and decided that they didn't want to say things anonymously anymore but rather mm -hmm. they were just the right people to speak for a larger larger group which is almost like a hidden talent that you haven't realized that person has that's super cool um i'm glad you could give such a such a tangible example um now can i ask you a little bit about uh, a little bit about you let's say um what is how is how is agency life <laughs> right now <laughs> how how i don't know how uh, how is it different how is it I have so many questions about agency life, to be honest, and and if priorities have shifted and and how you're you're seeing things um, from that standpoint now. I'm sure there are a lot of people watching that are probably in a similar situation to you. So, yeah, no, it's um, I mean, it's it's fascinating because the and I think it, it's really dawned on me how important or how central the physical space of an agency is to its culture. And I think it has a disproportionate impact than other industries. Hmm. I think the environment that you set up in, whether it's a studio or the agency, uh, 
from the decisions you make around your foyer, whether it's a set very rigid or whether it's more open plan, whether you have, you know, boardrooms that are open or there's glass, whether you have, you know, music playing, uh, who's controlling that music, um, how you design spaces for people to run into each other. Um, you know, what type of, whether you have work on the walls or don't have work on the walls, uh, you know, whether there are events happening, whether there are not, are they all company events? Are they team specific events? Like all those decisions are all centered really around the space. Mm -hmm. And that space then has this knock on impact around how people feel when they come into that environment, which sets the tone for then how they interact with each other and um, how they actually then behave in out in the world with clients online. Um, but it all starts from there. So it's just been really interesting to be out of that environment for now. What are we, I mean, we're not far off a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, nine months, certainly uh, looking at a year. And it's like, well, wow, what, what has our culture changed? Have we been, or, or is, is it just preserved? Has it evolved? Because um, we've also, we've had people and plenty of companies well have had people join without ever being into an office. Yeah. We have complete remote onboarding. So what is, what is their, how, how do they see the culture of that company today? And then how does that inform how they behave? Um, and, and, it, and it's fascinating. I, I'll be honest. I, I, I don't have the answer to any of these. These are all questions that I'm, we're, we're asking right now. <laughs> um, we're also asking what does the future look like in uh, assuming some sort of hybrid environment where, you know, there isn't an expectation that you're in Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, but the, it is more of a digital default environment where there are minimum expectations for how you will, you know, operate within a certain, um, you know, geography. Uh, now, whether that's, uh, you know, two days a week, um, but then how do you decide those days? Uh, do you do them on by team? Do you do it by project? Uh, or maybe it's just a certain types of prod meetings are in person. They are, you know, project kickoffs, big prime presentations and, maybe a monthly team meeting. Those are the minimum meetings. Um, but it also begs the question, if that becomes the case, then what is your footprint as a result of that? You know, you see potentially talent being more distributed across the US. It was always, um, again, I'm speaking from a very US centric, but I imagine there'll be similar patterns, uh, just different cities, but people, um, you know, maybe not going to the historically, you know, uh, urban centers that they would have in the past and going to maybe alternate areas and spaces. Um, it's definitely happening in the UK with the north of England instead of London yeah. um, being an alternative. You're seeing in the US uh, without San Francisco, New York and being some other areas. So then does your footprint change to be instead of, um, you know, five or six major offices, maybe you have two hubs and lots of little spokes and lots of like hubs, which are, which I think is really interesting it's funny that we work like really had that kind of fall from grace. But I think we would be a fast, fantastic, fascinating business to be in right now, because I think the actual ability for companies to be able to go out there and purchase you know pockets of space in different areas that maybe they could start with like a Squarespace S template and then add their own brand layer on it and have access to maybe you know 10 15 20 sites um, that they can then recruit and have build hubs around um, I think it's really interesting um, but that's really going to inform then come back to how we started this conversation I think around what that future culture then is yeah. um, so I, I think it's like almost like it, it, it's it's kind of virtuous circle uh, that one kind of informs the other, but I, and I don't think you can look at culture without thinking about what the, the reality of the future working environment is like and vice versa and in, in agencies at least. But I mean, it's probably true for a lot of types of work, but I just think agencies it is again, because of how I started this conversation, it, it's just intensified. Hmm. It's also a super creative industry. So I think then, yeah, like you say, everything just becomes a little bit more heightened um, because of maybe the nature of the talent, the nature of the work, the nature of, of, of all of those factors combined. Um, but I do want to ask you, um, and I know that we have just a few minutes left, but I do want to ask you, you know, what's something that you're actively working to change in our industry? You know, what's something that's super important to you? And and maybe how are you going about doing that? Um. Sure. I mean, uh, one thing, and it, uh, I think is, and it's interesting that attention has been given this year, but something that we've been, I think, focused on uh, for a while is, especially in the design industry, is representation mm -hmm. um, and creating equal opportunities. Um, it's 
something that you know has been given so much more attention i think this year than it has any other um and i think we're finally starting to see like actually kind of both the opportunity but also where the real challenge is and i think in the us i think we'd be guilty of this as well you know we hide behind statistics by bucketing groups of people into you know people of color in our organization in our design team by versus saying well actually how many of those people are black for example in your us office because then suddenly those numbers look very very different um so being a lot more honest in terms of how we're actually looking at our representativeness of our teams um and breaking them down by discipline um and not hiding behind i think um bucketing groups by looking to make the numbers seem more appropriate yeah uh, and actually uh being more honest and open and then putting that out there and saying we're going to stay accountable um, and but, but but more than anything putting plans in place to address that whether that's you know being much more focused on your recruitment efforts and making sure you're sourcing a diverse range of candidates um or and which is great or and I, this is what i'm really proud of is actually working uh, on grassroots community issues where you're actually creating pathways for youth into those environments and using your agency as a beacon to you know get people who may not see themselves in those spaces or see role models in those spaces normally as that they're a place for them um that there are those jobs um and we actually so for four years now we've been working on a, a program as a local not-for-profit in um in Dumbo where our office is in Brooklyn called Stoked and what they do is they create mentorship opportunities for students between the age of 14 and 16 who are at risk of dropping out of school and probably not and, and or not going to college um in more underserved communities across New York City across the five boroughs and um what we decided to do was partner with them four years ago to create a design thinking curriculum which is a nine-month program where people from our company and so far we've had over 100 uh, huge employees um, work on this program we've had 500 students go through it um, and over around 3,000 hours of um, mentorship where they have over the course of nine months in their school year they will identify a problem in their community they will build a product or solution idea create a brand and then pitch it to a set of industry judges and then the winning team each year will get you come, come to huge for that summer and do a summer internship and make let the thing actually build the thing and let it come to life um and it's oh, been cool. you know one of the most rewarding thing i've got to work on um and i remember i, I can just share some anecdotes we've had students who've said um oh my i wait you can do that like this is just someone just sketching typography it's like wait that's a job wait you get paid for that um and it's just it's just mind blowing. Like another one, i remember one student who is still in touch with us he says you know i'm a photographer now like i found my like calling at huge and one of these internships um and it, it's, it's amazing because you just start to see these like developmental pathways open up in a way that they just didn't before. And honestly, the ideas that that these some of these students have, I mean, one of them, one of the groups, just to give you an example, was uh, they identified that um, homeless people didn't have access to enough femin feminine hygiene products. Mm -hmm. So they created a brand called Just Period, fighting for menstrual justice. Um, and they partnered with um, a couple of other big brands here and they did a bunch of fundraising. Um, and it was so successful that actually got picked up by Vice and Vice did a documentary with them. Um, we had another uh, school who found all these unused skateboards and they said they were going to um, turn them into, uh, reusing it, turn them into musical instruments. So they turned them into um, drumsticks and guitar picks. Uh, like amazing, amazing. And these are 14 to 16 year olds, um, students. So I know it's that, that, for, that for me, it, it's, it's stuff like that. And the more that we can, take a stance as an agency and actually for, and for what it's worth that curriculum is now open source we uh, made it open source last year we shared all our learnings and our goal is just to encourage any creative agencies to partner with um, local youth in their areas um, and can just literally replicate the project um, the program um, to create these kind of learning moments and it, it's honestly so rewarding and to, you see over the course of a school year a bunch of you know employees who and talent who at first the students they're not really talking to each other and then mm -hmm. by the end of the year they're going up to present and their fist pumping and uh yeah, it, it's just it's one of the honestly one of the best days of the year well on that note <laughs> i think that's a great note to end on um that sounds amazing i need to i need i i, I want to go look into this more now yeah if you, you say can look it's them out open source calls. then maybe yeah. i can maybe i can spread the spread the word a bit more and see if there's anybody great. here that would like to use it as well because it's replicable anywhere so 
I'm sure there are agencies here locally and I'd love to see them get more involved and maybe some of them just don't know how, you know, and you present the way and and they're more than yeah. willing to do it. So I'll definitely, I'll ping you yeah. afterwards and then we can- Yeah, we can you, go to, you can go to hugeinc.com forward slash curriculum and you can download the curriculum and all the worksheets okay. there. Um, and I can, yeah, I can share more on, um, and the organization that we work with is called Stoked, Stoked mm -hmm. um, Mentoring.org. Um, they're a brilliant program, uh, a brilliant company here in New York. We actually just did a documentary following three of the students over the course of a school year. Um, and we just did a, it, it's going to hopefully launch um, in the new year. We're going to put it hopefully into a couple of um, festivals. It's not, it doesn't really feature us, feature us much. It's, it's mostly on the, the organization itself, but they're a yeah, tremendous, tremendous organization. That's great. Congrats on that. Really fantastic, fantastic work. Anyways, I really, really appreciate you being here as always. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone that was here and everybody that watched. I think we're going to say bye to you for now, but uh, you'll obviously see me again tomorrow <laughs> for uh, the next live session. So definitely, yeah, definitely stay tuned. Um, check the website and uh, the whole schedule is there. So until then, Richard, I say thank you once more and I'll talk to you soon. And I say, have a great day to everybody else. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you, Fabia. Bye, guys. Bye.